He loves coffee so much it was everywhere, in his locker or even at the Grand Canyon. He doesn't always drink wine, but when he does, he took a picture of himself to shoot hoops with it. He balled out weighing so much, his team paid a half million dollars to keep him in shape. He is Boris Diaw, the most interesting basketball player in the world. But what happened to Boris? He's one of the most skilled players we have ever seen, one most improved and a chip, but this is not a Boris Diaw love fest. This dude was far from perfect on and off the court. This video is an honest look at Boris Diaw and what he's doing now. Hey, it's Casey. Welcome to another Feature Friday on AM Hoops. You guys really love these Feature Fridays. At some point, we're going to run out of what happened to, and we'll have to go to a different formula. But really, no one suggested Boris Diaw. Honestly, he was just one of my favorite players to cover when I used to work in San Antonio covering the Spurs. And just to watch, he was such an enigma about what he looked like physically and what he could do on the court. His story is really interesting. I mean, to be this good looking like this, you gotta have natural ability. And Boris had that. His mom, Elizabeth, is one of the best centers in French women's basketball history at just six foot two. Well, Boris is six foot eight, 250 pounds, and could do almost everything. Shoot, pass, defend. He grew up idolizing Magic Johnson. Bill Walton described it best. What a classical human being he is. It was 201 years ago today that Beethoven's Symphony No. 3 in E-flat, which escorted in the age of romanticism in music. And when I look at Boris Diaw, I think of Beethoven in the age of the romantics. Okay. As a kid in France, he went to school with Tony Parker, and they were stars back home. Parker got to the NBA first, and by the time Boris was drafted in 2003, his friend was winning titles. Diaw, though, was drafted to the awful Atlanta Hawks. I'm talking 13 wins bad in 2005. Tony used to call Boris every night to let him vent. Even worse than losing was the Hawks trying to change Boris's game. They wanted him to be a score first point guard. Seriously, Boris Diaw. He was so committed to being pass first though, that Boris wouldn't even try. When his coach pulled him aside, Boris literally told him, I can't play for you, so trade me. So they sent Diaw and two first round picks to the Suns for Joe Johnson. This was small ball before the Warriors. Amari Stoudemire got hurt and 6'8 Boris played center. With that move, Boris jumped from five points, five boards and two assists per game to 13 points, seven boards and six assists for a better team. The Suns played unselfish, up-tempo basketball and Boris loved the game again. He won most improved in 06 and scored 34 points in a playoff game. One Suns writer said they were two perfect players for Mike D'Antoni, Steve Nash, and Boris Diaw. Honestly, I think Boris could fit into any team in the right role, because he could do everything. Yeah, he was pass first, but in a big game, if you needed it, he would drop 30. Dude was heavy, but his basketball IQ put him in the position to defend more athletic players. Bottom line, Boris Diaw dominated the way he liked to play. If a team put him in a different role though, he was impossible to coach. He demanded a trade with the Hawks. The Suns eventually dealt him to Charlotte, who needed him to score with a bad team, but he complained instead. And who complains about scoring? His mentality was so different, some coaches didn't know what to do. His coach in Charlotte told an insane story. Quote, I asked him, do you want to be an all-star? And he said, not really. When he got the ball, I asked him to score, but he wouldn't. He would be so close to put the ball in the hole, but he would just throw it out to somebody who could shoot a three. I would tell him, you're open, just lay the ball in, but he just didn't want to hear it. Eventually, Boris let his weight balloon to new heights, and the team had no choice but to bench him. Then Boris demanded a trade, but it was pretty tough to deal an overweight, disgruntled vet. And that is what is so confusing about Boris Diaw. I mean, if you watch him on the court, you think, oh, this is the most unselfish player in the world. Like, he is pass first. He would much rather see one of his teammates do well than him take all the glory, scoring a bunch of points. But the way he quit on multiple teams 
was seriously selfish. We really haven't seen another player like him, but the good news was that if a team got him in the correct role, they had a winning player. And that perfect role ended up being in San Antonio. Charlotte bought out Dial's contract and he signed with Tony Parker's Spurs. The two friends were teammates again for the first time since high school and Dial lived with Tony the first two years in San Antonio. Finally, Boris could be himself. And that's where a lot of the most interesting man moments happened. On the court though, the moments were historic. They made the postseason in 2012, losing to the Thunder. In 2013, the Heat came back to beat them in the finals, but they won it all in 2014, with Dial starting the final three games. It was one of the key adjustments Pop made. That beautiful ball movement San Antonio was known for wouldn't have been possible without Boris Diaw. But maybe Pop's best coaching moment was getting Diaw to actually score in a big spot. In the 2014 Conference Finals, Parker got hurt, so Boris dropped 26 efficient points to close out the Thunder. It makes sense that Greg Popovich would be the coach to convince him to score first. After that Spurs chip though, Boris played just three more NBA seasons. The final one was in Utah, then he played one more year back at home in France. So what happened to Boris Diaw? Well, he became deeply involved in the game in France. He was an owner and president of the club that he played on growing up, but as of 2019, he is president of Metropolitans 92. Now officially, he scouts players around the globe, but I think that's just an excuse to travel the world on his catamaran. Dial has always taken crazy adventures to like Africa or South America. He even wrote a book while he was playing called Hoops to Hippos. But now he is sailing to really wherever he feels like that day. He even dropped by Tim Duncan's place in the Caribbean. Hey, what's up, Tim? I'm in the Virgin Islands. I'm in the I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the BVI on my boat. Oh my like, boat. Oh, cool. That's that's awesome, man. I'm 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 in St. Croix for, for for a week. He's like, all right, I'll be there in two days. He's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. Well, <laughs> that's great. He docks like uh, like uh, four or five miles from my place. And I uh, go out and hang out on his boat for a day and, 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 and check him out. He's a, he's a dive master. He, he, he's he's a dive he master. Does. By far one of my favorite teammates of all time. Like, yeah. he's just, like, real talk. He is just the dude, Boris Diaw. The only trace of Diaw now in the league is other French players like Rudy Gobert or Nicolas Batum. Batum actually says he wants to be the Boris Diaw of this season. Turns out that's working pretty well for the Clippers right now. So unsurprisingly, a unique retirement and legacy for Boris Diaw. Not always the easiest guy to coach in the league, but in the right role, he was the perfect player and the most interesting one too. Support AM Hoops and click subscribe. Don't miss a daily NBA video.